Good morning. I'm now going to call to order this meeting of the Minneapolis Audit Committee on Tuesday, September 19th. My name is Lene Palmasano and I'm the chair of this committee. With me at the dais are the following committee members. We have Council Member Alondra Cano, David Fisher, Vice Chair Scott Neal, Council Member John Quincy, and Commissioner Liz Wolensky. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Colleagues, on our agenda today is just one new report from our Department of Internal Audit as well as um, the regular update. So may I have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended or as proposed? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the agenda. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The agenda is adopted. First, we need to accept the minutes from our last meeting on June 27th. So I will move adoption of those minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it and the minutes for that meeting are adopted. Colleagues, before us today is the Minneapolis Police Department body camera audit. Body cameras are an important tool for safety and for transparency in our city, but like any tool, it's the responsibility of the user to ensure that it's used appropriately. So after a series of high profile incidents this year, we directed our audit team to look into the use of body cameras. Part of this was also to fulfill the state's requirement, um, though it, this would be early. It was after um, six months of use. We'll also be satisfying the state's legislative requirement today. So um, here to present the results of that audit is our Director of Internal Audit, Will Tetzel. Mr. Tetzel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Audit Committee. My name is Will Tetzel. I'm the Director of Internal Audit here at the City of Minneapolis. And um, on the agenda, like you said, we just have that one audit, um, which is the mobile and body worn camera. Uh, after that, I will also give the typical auditor update that you're used to seeing. Uh, we don't have a robust follow up report for you um, for this committee. We'll give that next committee. Um, the cadence of those didn't fall right before this committee, and there was more information that would have been on the next. So you'll get a more robust follow up of past audit finding remediations at the next meeting. Mr. Tetzel, just to be clear for others in the room, what you mean are follow ups to previous audits of other yep. topics like the workman's yeah. compensation. All the outstanding audit. findings from our prior work. The, great. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we will get into the the body camera audits. Um, so to provide a little background, um, the Minneapolis Police Department utilizes body-worn cameras and squad car cameras to record instances of police work and interactions. The usage is dictated by policy and is governed in part by state statutes. Both the body-worn camera and squad cameras, which we refer to in this report as mobile video, um, have systems that officers and administrators use to access, archive, categorize, view, share, and delete information. The objective of the audit was to determine whether cameras and respective programs were being used and executed in accordance with statutes and policies and were adequately designed, administered, and monitored. Mr. Tessel, I think this is, um, I, I just want to also set up how we'll operate here. I think it might work best and most comfortably if as people have questions from the dais here that you just raise your flag and I'll be, I'll be looking if you want clarification on a specific item. I also forgot to mention, but it's very important to mention um, that we have the police with us here today. So thank you, Assistant Chief Jost, uh, Commander Granger, Deputy Chief Halverson for being here and being part of this audit. Um, what we like best about our audit committee is that we bring in a department and we work together with them on what um, what we find and, and that's really integral to making improvements at the end of the day. So thank you um, to the Minneapolis Police Department for being here today. Yeah, thanks. Um, going through audit objectives and scope notes, um, the audit consisted of multiple work streams, primarily the Minnesota State Legislative Requirements. Um, as you all know, this has been on our audit plan already. We planned on doing this work. Um, it was just expanded. We looked at IT general controls around the technology and equipment and general usage and body-worn camera policy review. The deck is organized with these chevrons in the top into these five categories. And so as we're going through these slides, the category that we're speaking to will be uh, highlighted in green so we don't get lost and we know where what topic we're on there. So. 
this is to sort of help everyone keep track of, of exactly where we are in this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Tetzel. I also just wanted to interject here that um, this, like audit, all audit reports, um, the report and the content of this report isn't public until we order it published. So I do have copies here for people that are interested. Um, and as soon as we do order that published, I'll give them to the clerk. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we will also put it on our website um, after, right after the meeting. So it'll be there as well on the internal audit website. So jumping into Minnesota state statutes, um, there are legislative requirements um, and we broke those down into 56 testable requirements under all of these different sort of domains that are listed below. I'm not gonna read them all out, but there are 56 unique items that we should be testing for under the Minnesota state statutes. Um, as we broke those down and tested, we found 16 of them to be non-compliant. Um, the majority of those were just gaps in the policy. So um, if we look down here to, into the policy gaps, it's things that the statute requires we have in our policy, but aren't in our policy. It doesn't mean we're not doing that. It just means it's not in our policy. Um, there were also access authorization and procedure issues and video classification issues. So part of the state requirements is that we assign um, a record type. And when I say that, I mean like public private, confidential, those type of record types to the categories that we have these videos in. So we have use of force, we have arrest, um, those need to be lined up. Um, there were 24 controls that passed and there were six of them that weren't testable. They all related to the biennial audit. So we don't test the fact that we did the audit because we're doing the audit. There were 16 controls as well that were compliant, but uh, we would recommend enhancements on those. So um, we have we have some detail that we can share with the committee and the police department in areas that we think uh, they're compliant, but advise that they enhance some of those processes that they're that they're doing there. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the the statutes really focus on, on policy and data, retention, classification, access, so on and so forth. Not as much use, so rather straightforward. Uh, this work was done by Backbone Consulting, so uh, there are co-sourced IT auditors, um, which would also make them an independent audit function. So as we get this to the governing body at the city and to the state, they can have that comfort that this, was, this work was done um, by a third party independent of the city. That's statute stuff. Any questions there? Are there any questions related to the state reporting requirements? I have one just because we've spoken about this um, and we were speaking about this yesterday with Deputy Chief Halverson. Um, we're six months into the active body camera program and is it fair to say that it's nice that we're doing this now because now we can build these things in and be fully compliant? Like would you expect a brand new program in this first six month period to necessarily meet all of these 56 criteria? Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know if I have an answer to that, honestly. I mean, we, we drafted our policy before the statutes came out or were finalized. Um, we, did, we did do a consultation in 2015 and one of the recommendations in that consultation over the body camera program was keeping tabs on the statutes to make sure that any changes we need to make in the program you know, remain there. So um, I don't know if it's fair to say we need a warm up period for, for that or six months or nine months or, or, or whatever. I don't know if I'm the best person to judge that. But what you are saying are, these are things that you feel are pretty straightforward to fix. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right, so now we're gonna jump into equipment and software. Uh, and as well, um, Backbone, our co-source IT auditors um, did this work. They're the experts here. So if detailed questions do come out of this, I might refer to them for some of these answers. There's a lot of technical stuff in a couple of these slides. Um, the police department chose Axon, which was formerly Taser for um, equipment and software vendor. We agreed with their choice when we did the, um, the the consultation of their pilot program. 
Um, and so we wanted to run through, through some of the equipment features here um, and talk about some of the, the limited work that we did. Um, there's up to a 12 hour battery life on the cameras. So we feel like they're sufficient. The batteries are adequate for a typical shift. Um, there's adequate data storage capacity. Um, I don't think we'll ever have to worry about the camera running out of storage space for video recording. Uh, they're tamper resistant. So this isn't like a camera that you buy as a consumer where you can take memory cards out or plug into your home computer. Uh, this is all of the connections are proprietary. This isn't something that you can tamper with and, and that officers or system administrators or anyone else can just simply plug a USB cord into and pull all the information out. We felt that was pretty important to talk about here um, from the public's perspective of, of no one has the option to, to fiddle with these things unless they just physically you know, destroy the cameras, which is different. Um, there is, um, like I mentioned, non-removable storage. The data is encrypted within the cameras at rest and in transit um, using the FIPS 140-2 cryptographic model, which from what I understand is, is extremely sophisticated. Um, as I mentioned, also the data port is proprietary. So where they dock their cameras to charge and upload isn't something that, that you can find equipment to do elsewhere. This is proprietary. Uh, there is a pre-event buffer with a mute option. So the cameras, they're consistently recording and then, del and then subsequently deleting that data until the, the, the button is pushed to activate. And then it stops deleting at whatever time frame that you set up the camera to stop deleting at. And that's called the buffer. So if you have, if you're wearing your camera and you have it on and you need to activate the video, you press the button, you have 30, it starts saving that 30 seconds back. 30 seconds is what we have currently set that buffer to um, for video only. Um, so it's muted. I think there's an option to, to not have muted. They've, they've chose to mute, but there's 30 seconds of video back if you have your camera powered on. <clears throat> I think that buffer can be extended up to two minutes from the 30 seconds, but beyond that, it doesn't have that capacity. There's also GPS with in-field tagging. So uh, officers, if they're in pursuit and, and something happens, they can they can use their camera to, to GPS tag that location if they need to go back or document you know, where things happened as they were doing their work. Um, it's weather resistant to an IP67 standard, which I know very little about, but apparently that's um, good. Um, there is remote activation capabilities with these cameras. That doesn't mean that here at City Hall that they can turn people's cameras on and off. That means there's other devices like a holster mechanism or things that you can put in the car if you open doors or turn lights on that can remotely activate the, the camera to turn on as well. Um, it's not a, we're watching you and we can watch through your camera as far as I know. And there are power and record indicators on the camera. So when the camera's on, there's a, um, an officer can tell there's a light that shows that the power is on. And then when it's recording, there's an, there's an indication light. So an officer or someone within their site could hopefully see that it's recording. We didn't find any issues with the equipment. We think it's great equipment. Um, there wasn't anything that we were concerned about with the equipment. Software, software and, and uh, the cloud. So we, in the consultation, we did a little bit more analysis on cloud storage. Back then, um, Axon was using the Amazon cloud. They've recently switched to the Microsoft Azure cloud. Um, we have an isolated cloud environment, um, which means our data isn't commingled with other municipalities, other body camera programs. Our data is segregated there. Um, the, it's CGIS compliant cloud environment too, so criminal justice information uh, requirements, um, they're all embedded into the, to the software in this cloud environment. Uh, the vendor does have a white paper on their CGIS compliance program that, um, that our IT auditors reviewed, and so we're happy with that. Um, there was also an independent SOC 2 Type 2 audit of the technology there. <clears throat> and what that is, is that's an independent, usually a CPA firm comes in and does an independent audit of their IT controls uh, to ensure that they're compliant. They do that so um, places like us can use those reports rather than go and auditing it ourselves or hiring someone to audit so they're not burdened by being audited all the time. They get it done at a frequency. 
and they provide it to um, people that, that use their, their systems or potentially customers too, or potential customers. Um, there are role-based access controls in the software. So they can, we have a bunch of roles. Administrators have uh, certain rights that the officers might not have, so on and so forth. So you can, um, you can customize those, um, those roles, and you can also configure retention schedules. So we have various types of, of video that we're recording. Example, non-evidence, or an arrest, or a startup, or a training. You can assign a retention schedule to, to all those video types. Uh, there's also detailed logging and reporting. Um, actually, very detailed logging and reporting. We're really happy to see how much detail we could get. You can pull up a camera, see when it was powered on, how long video it took. You can, uh, there's information down there on, on the battery life. Um, really good logging there. Uh, there's also MPD smartphone integration. So with a camera comes a smartphone that's integrated. They can use that phone to categorize and, and work with some of the video rather than having to come back at the end of their shift and, and do all that administrative work. So they can do that in the field. Um, there's, there's capability for multi-factor authentication. And what that means is you have your typical um, sign in and password, but um, they can also have another mechanism, uh, another layer of authentication for you to get in. So that could be, sometimes you can get a, like an electronic token that has a number that rotates. Um, sometimes it can be, uh, I wanna log in, send me a text message to, this, to the phone number that you have for me, send a text, plug that in, and another layer of authentication. Right now, administrators are using multi-factor. We're recommending they consider that, that all officers use multi-factor authentication. Um, the videos have forensic, basically forensic fingerprints on them. So it's SHA-2 hash is, is the technical term, but basically it's a series of, of characters assigned to each video. And <clears throat> if you do anything to the video, um, truncate it, redact pieces of it, that hash will change. And so you can always compare the original to any video that anyone's using to authenticate whether or not it's been altered or anything has been done with it. Um, there's tamper-proof audit logs. So audit logs for the cameras and the videos, um, all of that is, is information that, that can't be altered by administrators, evidence.com, officers. It's all there in tamper-proof. Mr. Tetzel, I'm just going to pause here. Mr. Neal has a question. Mr. Tetzel, just a question about the forensic fingerprint uh, item. Does that finger, is there a different fingerprint when an, uh, a video is shared? So. If you're the recipient of a shared video, is there a is there a, is there a, a unique fingerprint for that as well, or is that or do we keep track of that with just some kind of logging system? I'm going to guess here, and, and they can confirm whether I'm right. I think it would be the same fingerprint to authenticate that that was an unaltered version of that original video. Okay. So if you did something before you shared it, like redacted faces yeah. or blurred out scenes, then it would be a different fingerprint. I'm correct. Sorry. Sorry, Madam Chair, for not addressing you. Um, there's a del deletion approval workflow, so um, things can't just be deleted um, accidentally or fat fingered with someone's keyboard, and original videos are never modified. So a key feature, if, if you start redacting or truncating videos, there's always that original copy that, that's not modified. The observations that we had around um, the software weren't about the vendor as much as they were about how the city was using it. Uh, and so we had a couple observations here. One, access control. So um, the state requires documented approvals for, for system access, which we're not doing for everyone. Um, we also think that they should be doing periodic access review. So as an, as an officer might leave employment with the city, uh, ensuring that their their system access, because evidence.com is web-based, so you could go at home and use it, um, that their access is, is truncated appropriately. Um, and document to, we ask them that they document their access control procedures. So what are the processes that they follow to provision, monitor, and control access to the system? Uh, and then we talked already about using the potential for using multi-factor authentication for 
a broader population of these um, camera users. The next is data categorization improvements. Um, and so right now training videos um, are set to be held for, for 90 days and then deleted. Um, but what we found in some of our work are, are that things could be miscategorized. So something that wasn't training could accidentally or purposely be categorized as training and in 90 days it would be deleted from the system. So we we're recommending that retention schedule be bumped up to one year. So in case anything was mislabeled, um, we wouldn't have issues of it being lost before we needed to use it or wanted to use it. Uh, and then mapping data, data categories to data classifications, like I mentioned before, there's public, private, I, I think use of force is public information, um, other footage is considered private, so mapping those record categories to the, to the categories that they have um, for the different video types. Uh, and then ensuring all videos have an, an assigned category, so if you don't assign a category, it'll be unclassified, um, which isn't really helpful for anyone. I, I understand the need that if, some, if an officer is going from one job to the next or one call to the next, that we shouldn't expect them to stop and do some of this, but eventually these things need to be categorized. And then lastly, um, all data categories should be listed in the policy. So right now they're not, and um, those data categories and we'll talk about that a little bit later, it should be potentially um, expanded and, and we should speak a little bit about how to use those and list those out in the policy. Any questions on the software piece? Any questions? No, not on this piece. Isn't it? Okay, we're gonna get into policy and training then. So, um, the scope here was uh, reviewing the policy for adequacy um, based on statutes and regulations and programmatic coverage. So we have, um, we have to comply with the Minnesota statutes because they have things that they're um, saying that we need in our policy. But we also looked at it uh, in general for a program of, of this scope and breadth, what would we expect to see in a policy? Um, then we'll talk about deviations from that policy and further considerations. So the initial body-worn camera policy was issued in June of 2016 and updated um, a couple of months ago, as, as most of us know. Uh, it's categorized within the, the 4-200 policy series that covers equipment and supplies. So um, if we think about the body camera program, it is, it is equipment, but if you think about how to administer, monitor, oversee the program, it's a little bit more broad in scope than equipment and supplies. So there's there's a potential there for an expansion of the policy and, and maybe where it sits and how it's, it's housed within the volumes of the police department policies and procedures. Um, the policy contains sections that cover to varying degrees the following. Officer and supervisor responsibilities, activation and deactivation requirements, data access retention and duplication rules, and critical incident protocol. Um, so in the body-worn camera policy, there are supervisor responsibilities, and it states that supervisors shall ensure that officers follow established procedures for the use and maintenance of the body-worn camera equipment and the completion of the documentation, which includes periodic review of recordings to ensure proper procedures are being followed. At the time of this audit, there was neither evidence of a process for supervisors to follow nor evidence that they review, that any review of officer body worn camera use or recordings. Um, the, the department is working on supervisor training and a process for them to, to review camera footage, um, but that just started this summer here. Um, with permission from my colleagues, um, I, I, I did not mention this before, but uh, one, of, one of our colleagues, Council Member Jacob Fry, has joined us today um, and I believe he has a question about this topic. So go That's ahead. All right. Oh, well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so my question was actually regarding the last slide. It says it, we, you discussed that the body camera policy was updated on July 29th of 2017. Uh, so it's my understanding that the so the audit uh, actually goes beyond Jul July 29th, 2017. Is that correct, Madam Chair, Councilmember Fry? Correct. We we tested several weeks of 
post policy video usage. Okay, so yesterday the mayor put out a statement saying that the updated policy was not tested by the audit. So uh, according to what you're saying, that's absolutely false. Madam Chair, Councilman Frank, correct. That's okay, false. thank you. I will continue. Um, this next slide uh, doesn't speak to Minnesota state statutes. This is our recommendation of um, items that the policy should cover, right? So I won't read it to you, but here's a laundry list of, of topics that we feel should be in the policy that either aren't there or aren't there in an adequate nature for anyone to understand how to use this program or administer some of these processes. Um, there is a little note at the bottom. As they develop the, the body-worn camera program, other aspects might come to light that need to be in here. So this isn't meant to be an exhaustive, do this in your, in your policies. Golden, it's here's things that we noticed when we were looking at this, this broad program that weren't addressed in the policy. Uh, we'll go into training here. So we looked at training materials for completeness. So covering the policy and the state statutes and then using that equipment and technology. Um, and then for the for completeness, um, we did look at attendance records and timing prior to the camera issuance. So the, the, the police department's BTU unit put together the training program and executed that an officer had to sit through the training program to, to be assigned a, a camera. So except for the pilot program where there might not have been a, as robust a training program, any officer that has a camera today has been through the PD's internal body-worn camera training, which uh, we'll talk about here on the next slide. So we compared the policy to the training materials to determine how comprehensive the training was. Um, and in general, it was, it was pretty comprehensive to the policy. And, and I'll remind everyone, we felt like there were some gaps in what the policy had. Um, there were three attributes that in the policy that weren't covered in the training materials. Um, these relate to situations like if, if a camera becomes, uh, if the battery dies and they, and they need to go back to the precinct, what do they do and who do they need to notify? So some of that information, um, everything else, we, we felt like they did a good job um, putting together in those training programs. As the policy is built out and the program is further built out, we would expect training and communication enhancements. So um, if if the MPD is, is going to build out their policy and expand the scope of this program, training can't be forgotten here. So that's, that's policy and training. Any questions on those two topics? Questions on policy and training, Commissioner Walensky. administrative review um, in the last slide. So basically you're asking the officers to report to their supervisors when they've made a mistake or when they think they've done something that they should be investigated for. Is that what that implies? Madam Chair, Commissioner Walensky, I don't know if I'm the right person to try to interpret that. Um, my guess is that it might include some an officer that witnessed something that could be of interest for a training purpose or, or anything else. Uh, it's kind of broad, so I, I don't know if I want to make Would assumptions about it. Would one of our representatives from the department be able to clarify that? Potentially. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to ask the members of the department. They, they will. Assistant Chief Joseph will speak at the end, yeah. um, but I'm just going to perhaps ask, you know, well, the, I'll the, keep the question in mind. Thank you. <clears throat> and it I'm, I'm going to uh, have you finish your presentation before calling up Bob. Sure. Madam Chair and Commissioner Walensky, it wasn't that we noticed discrepancies in this. It's that this wasn't something that was in the policy, in the training. So the, in the training, they didn't cover that specific topic, whatever it might be. Uh, Mr. Neal and then Mr. Fisher. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Tetzel, in the in the report, you referenced a couple of times uh, how what the policy is regarding off off duty work and when cameras are used or or worn in off duty work. What are examples of off duty work that uh, officers would wear their camera and activate it at the appropriate times? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Neal. I don't know a lot about off-duty work. Off-duty work is uh, is approved work through the department where officers can be uh, uniformed with, with squad cars and work for um, private companies or businesses within the city. Um, it might be um, security or it might be just presence, things like that. So if you go to Target, you might see a uniformed MPD officer. They could be working for Target in an off-duty capacity. Um, Whole Foods is another example. So there's the, the city allows uh, and I think have worked out with the police union um, how that operates. But it's, I don't have a lot of information on exactly what it looks like and how it works. Um, in the policy, it does require that the officers with the camera wear it on approved off-duty work. So if they're on approved off-duty work, they should be they should have the camera on and be using it as they would if they were on duty. Okay, so all off-duty work, not just some off-duty work. All approved off-duty All approved off-duty work. Off work. Yeah. yeah. So just to clarify, Mr. Tetzel, I think, I think what um, was found that it's very difficult to audit something like that because we don't have the data to try and map footage to a schedule in this in, in that particular case. That's part of why we had to limit this to just you know on duty work for the city. Although we do indemnify officers for approved off duty work. Um, Commissioner Walensky, did you have a follow up? <sighs> Sorry, question? Mr. Fisher. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Tetzel, in in the report, it's a little vague to me. It says uh, in the use and trends section that the <clears throat> BWC use begins with a startup video. These are videos that the officers view in terms uh, that cover the use of the BWC. Is that correct? Madam Chair, Mr. Fisher, um, correct. I'll, I'll start with the next section in the startup videos. Well, this in, res in respect oh, sure. to training, sure. I was wondering, is that the extent of the officer tra training for the BWC use? No. Oh. It's just one aspect, yeah. Okay, so there is actually hands-on instructional use of the, of the unit? I didn't attend trainings, um, so I can't attest to that. Um, but oh, you indicated that that the video is not the only training. I'm just wondering what additional training there was, other than uh, just it, so the it video. covered everything in the policy: how to use the camera and how to use the associated okay. software. So you know, there's the software called Evidence.com. You know, when your videos get uploaded there, how do you categorize them? Okay. How do you use that software? So okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And just. Um, I am kind of putting these in a parking lot and, and we'll ask Assistant Chief Joe just to comment a little bit about how we rolled this out because it was precinct by precinct in-person training mm -hmm. uh, to roll out the body camera program. Yeah. So, go ahead. All right, so we'll jump into usage then. Um, so the review scope here, it, we compared police dispatch data to video recordings to measure how often cameras are being used uh, when required. Um, we picked CAD data because that's information that's um, that's stored outside or, or input outside of the police department. Um, that's when we could. T that's our best sense of the entire population of of when officers are dispatched to a situation. And there's enough detail in there for us to understand um, when officers are dispatched, if they actually did respond to that, and the type of incident that it was. So really good data to start with. From a here's where we expect to see camera footage. Um, now, the policy changed um, this summer. So before policy, there were very certain things that the camera was required to be used for. After the policy change, it was basically everything. Any dispatch, any call, turn your camera on. But we used, our starting point was that um, computer-assisted dispatch um, data to see whether or not a, a video was existed for that data there. Uh, and then we did an analysis of recorded video to measure how adequately cameras were being used when required, an analysis of recorded video and dispatch data to measure how correctly videos were being categorized. 
So we'll start with startup and activation. Um, so startup check wasn't being done sometimes or was sometimes being done in the field. A startup check is, is the purpose of it um, is to make sure that your camera is operable before you head out into the field and, and get started. Because once you're out there, if your camera is not working, it, it's kind of a drag. And you'd rather understand that before you leave the precinct with your car and all of your other equipment. So it's required that every officer at the beginning of every shift does a startup video and categorizes it as a startup video. Mr. Tetzel, I think um, you had mentioned earlier yesterday with Deputy Chief Halverson that I think you said if there's an equipment malfunction, the protocol is typically that an officer would re would return to the precinct when that's practicable. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, okay. Yeah, the, I mean, a supervisor could make the decision of it's more important for you to, to stay out there and keep, you know, stick with this incident. Um, if you need to document later why your camera wasn't working, you know, there's, there's guidelines for how to do that and where to do that. Um, we also looked at cameras not capturing the beginning of events and cameras not capturing a 30 second preview of the recording information. Um, so we talked about that buffer, that 30 second buffer, uh, and I mentioned that buffer works when your camera is powered on. If your camera is powered off and you hit the record button, it, it doesn't have that 30 second rolling buffer that it's been saving internally, so you won't have that 30 second preview. You'll just have from when you push the button, which turned the camera on and activated the record function. So we have this table here, uh, which is probably hard for a lot of people to see, um, but it goes through the startup test results. So um, we broke it out to a percentage of time that a startup does not exist before and after policy and the percentage of time the startup is done in the field before and after policy. So uh, for startup videos, the percent of time that a startup video does not exist before policy was 44% of the time, after policy 24% of the time. So there was an improvement there. Uh, and then the percentage of time that the startup was done in the field before policy change, 10% of the time, after policy change, 12% of the time. So a little, little worse in the performance there. Um, now I'm gonna jump into um, some activation test results. So um, starting in with dispatch data, we selected a sample, a statistically relevant sample, and then tied that back to evidence.com to look at the videos there. Um, so one of the one of the tests that we wanted to do was whether the video existed to begin with, right? Um, so we did this for CAD base and for use of force. Um, for use of force before the policy, 26% um, of the time, the videos did not exist in evidence.com. After the policy change for use of force, 7% of the time videos did not exist in evidence.com. For CAD base, which is a more general bucket, um, before the policy change, 35% of the videos did not exist in evidence.com. And after the policy change, 29% of the videos did not exist in evidence.com. I'll repeat that. We tested whether or not a video existed based on CAD data, looked for videos. 29% of the time after the policy change, there, a video did not exist for an officer that was dispatched to go to an incident. A couple more columns here. Percentage of videos uh, not active before the incident. So this is broken up by category. Um, I'll just talk about CAD base because you can see the details, but 10% of the time before the policy changed, the videos weren't active before the situation. After the fact, 11% of the time, cameras weren't active before the incident. So for my interpretation of the new policy, you activated the camera when you left to arrive at the scene. But 11% of the time when a video existed, it was turned on after the, they arrived at an incident. Um, the last column here on the bottom right, we looked at the percentage of videos missing that buffer. So how many times was the camera completely powered off and turned on um, by the officer pressing the record button 
rather than leaving it on and then pressing record to be able to capture that 30 second buffer. Um, so I'll talk just about CAD based, but before the policy, 23% of the time, we weren't able to capture that buffer because the cameras were powered off. And after the policy changed 24% of the time, we weren't able to capture that buffer because the cameras were powered all the way off. And just to be clear, Mr. Tetzel, how, I know that one of the things from the equipment and software standpoint was that um, battery use doesn't seem to be a problem with this equipment. So um, I, I don't want you to conjecture, but it, whether or not we think police officers are trying to like save their battery life, but is there a way that that's been audited? Like when you're, re when you're taking this sample of size of footage, are you able to see what the battery life was on, on the recordings that happened? And I guess, can you comment on that? Yes, Madam Chair. There is information there. Um, the, each camera has an audit log and you can look at that audit log for whenever that camera was used. Um, we did look at an audit log for um, a post policy um, day where we would expect it, more footage to, to be recorded. Um, and it, it shows battery levels. I think at the end of the day, there was 20% of battery life left, about 20% of battery life left after a 10 hour shift. So. Thank you. I think that's important to mm -hmm. keep in mind as we go forward and keep using these cameras. Mr. Neal, you had a question. Yes, Madam Chair, Mr. Mr. Tetzel, this the 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 data that you're presenting is in a, a binary format, right? They it either did comply or it did not comply. Mm -hmm. So, if I were to read the 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 evidence that 29 percent uh, did not exist, is the presumption is it safe to presume that 71 percent of the time it did exist, or is there another category of undetermined or something nope, like that? It was there or not? Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. I think. Um, I think the audit report goes into some detail about then whether or not that footage was useful, yep. right? We'll, we'll Obscured or, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or or perhaps the camera yeah. wasn't with the person right. with, during the event. Okay. Um, now we're going to get into deactivation of the camera. So. Camera act is activated um, when dispatched, and then the officer needs to deactivate the camera when an incident's concluded. So um, cameras aren't always capturing, one, cameras aren't always capturing a clear view of events. So Madam Chair, and to your point, Mr. Neal, there's times when we have video, but it's it's not as useful as you'd like it to be. Um, that just happens, and you know, we've seen ones where uh, officers get in a scuttle with someone, th their camera falls off. You know, stuff like that's going to happen. Right? It's just that's how it works. Um, it's, it might be dangerous to permanently attach it to to them. But then it might be, become something that someone can ragdoll you with. You know, and so I think they're held on with magnets. So they, at times they do fall off, but I, I think that they're secured there pretty well. Mr. Neal, yeah. thank you for that clarification. The, the only point I was trying to make was within the seventy-one percent in the other slide. There's, there's even a further division of video that is useful and video that is not, right? Madam Chair, correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we looked for clear view events. We looked for um, whether or not the camera was turned off prior to the event conclusions. So cameras were frequently turned off in transports when arriving at the jail, but before custody of, um, of the person in the car was, was handed over to the jailer. Uh, and then cameras turned off without explanation. So in the policy, if a camera is deactivated before an incident is concluded, um, they're instructed to um, document that can either be, you know, just saying something before you turn the camera off that would let people know why you're deactivating it or, um, or something in um, the, the dispatch system or something in CAPERS, which is the records management system. And Mr. Tetzel, not necessarily right away, but as they write up the report, it should be noted why yeah. they turned a the camera off after the fact. Yep, and, and we saw that. You know, we saw people saying, you know, the, um, I deactivated early, here's why, or, you know, I didn't even have footage, here's why. So there were, there were good examples of, of people following that policy of, of when you would expect to see a video or when you would expect a video to continue, why that didn't happen. <clears throat> 
Um, so of sampled videos, 22% of body-worn cameras were deactivated prior to the event ending under the old policy, and this went down to 12% under the new policy, so there was some improvement there. And of these events, 71% did not have a narrated reason for deactivation under the old policy, and under the new policy, 51% didn't have a narrated um, documentation for why the camera was deactivated prematurely. Here is another table full of data that, unfortunately, a lot of the audience can't um, probably really see. Um, we broke down usage and deactivation test results by categories, so use of force, uncategorized video, CAD-based, and, um, and we also looked at repeat activations and deactivations. So there are incidents where an officer would turn the camera off, turn it back on because the incident was still continuing, turn it back off, on, off, on. So there's, um, there are some reasons for that. Um, in, in the old, in the policy, there, I think you can interpret it to, for certain ways to be able to do that. Um, Excuse me, Mr. Titzel, there's sure. reasons in policy to turn on and off a body camera several times throughout a specific call. Well, not to that, Madam Chair, not to that clarity. I would say uh, the policy did, uh, and don't quote me on the exact verbiage, but allow officers to turn the camera off, turn the camera off if they were having a conversation with another officer. Uh, and so if they were in the middle of an arrest, sometimes you would see them turn the camera off to have a conversation with another officer, or if they're at a scene, they, they interpreted that language to mean that allowed them to turn the camera off. Uh, we're not saying whether that's right or wrong, um, but we did test activations and deactivations, so that's happening, though. Um, so there, that probably needs to be clarified in the policy, and I'm, I'm pretty sure there's something in the report that, that recommends some clarification on what that actually means. And I, I do understand when, when two officers are communicating that there's not always a need for that to be reported. I don't know if that intended to be at the at the scene of a crime or responding to uh, a call. It's Got not it. clear. Um, so again, more detail here on usage and deactivation test results that I won't read through. Um, the next slide is categorization test results. Um, so as I mentioned, um, an incident is filmed, and then an officer can either use their phone to categorize that video into use of force, not evidence, startups, training, significant incident, citation. There's a bunch of categories they can use. Um, so we looked at uncategorized video to see what it was. Why was it uncategorized? Um, so I'll go through a couple of, of um, highlights here. For use of force, 14% of uncategorized videos before the policy change were use of force videos. Um, not, okay, not, sure. uh, and then post policy, 31% were not properly categorized as use of force videos. Um, combined results, post policy change, 27% of videos were misclassified. Mr. The, sure. Mr. Tetzel, I'm just trying to summarize this table. I know we're about to run into the committee of the whole meeting here, but the summary of this table, I think from the numbers that are on it, are that um, training is a frequent miscategorization that officers are labeling things training when they shouldn't be. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Yes, so before policy, 57% were weren't categor were categorized as training, but that was inaccurate and after policy 56 percent of videos categorized as training weren't accurate again training are the types of videos that are deleted after 90 days got it so that's that's an important one to get right but if they change that retention schedule to a year it's less of an issue uncategorized videos are saved in perpetuity or until they're categorized and then meet a retention schedule so the fact that they're uncategorized doesn't mean there's a risk of them being deleted it's just really unhelpful if you're trying to run statistics or get information on the types of videos that you're recording. If someone wanted to look at all the startup videos, but 
the classification of order of all messed up, it's just, it doesn't really, it doesn't really help if you're administering and running this program. Got it. Do I need to speed up? A little bit, yeah. Um, I want to point out, and as soon as this audit report gets published, there's a lot of great graphs in the back of this report that are illustrative of some of the usage data. Um, so we also went through mobile video. I'll just, I'll just kind of skim through these. I think most people are interested in the body camera program. Um, we have a couple slides here that I think are interesting. Um, we looked at the number of minutes per hour that there were um, video recordings for every officer that was issued a camera for shifts that they would be expected to be um, um, responding to calls. Um, and what we noticed was that if you look at these charts, I think 23% of the recordings over this entire time um, had one minute or less of video per hour worked by an officer. 23%. Um, we did pull out sergeants and lieutenants because that skewed it a little bit, so that graph is in there as well. We also analyzed the data presented by the chief of police um, yesterday into the categories. Um, so here's a depiction of of what those two tables look like that he presented yesterday from a category from a category perspective. So you can see here that things like um, arrest evidence almost doubled from pre to post policy. It's a little concerning because I would have expected to see at least double the amount before the policy change. So when there was things like an arrest or evidence, there was you know, half as much video before. You can see a pretty large bump up in the not evidence general recording. That's the majority of videos after, before, it's hard to say whether it's majority. So Mr. Tetzeliff, to summarize the slide, is it that proportionally speaking, the huge increase in hours of video and the numbers of video are actually non-evidence or general recording time? That's what, that's what they're categorized as, yes. I see. Those categories we can't really dive into. Put a whole much. lot of weight to, but that's what they're categorized as. Got it. Let's skip through and talk about um, oversight here. And I'm really just going to read off the slide, and this is directly out of the report. But um, as stated in the MPD body worn camera policy, this program's goal was to enhance accountability and public trust. The policy continues in stating that the policy provides MTV, MPD personnel with procedures for the use and management of body worn camera equipment and resulting data. What the policy and program lack are how the program is to be governed and by whom. So it doesn't talk about who's running this thing and who's responsible for this. Um, the, the PD's business technology unit conducted a pilot of the equipment and technology, developed and executed a training program, and implemented the equipment and technology used across the police department. From the implementation, it's not apparent to us that any division with the MPD or the city focused on oper 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 yeah, I'm not going to say that word. <laughs> operation of the program in pursuit of its original goals of, of enhancing accountability and public trust. So to us, it didn't appear like the, the spirit of this program lived through, after its rollout through the precincts. Um, I have a few slides here about policy or all the findings that are in the report. And I'm assuming you want to skip the auditor update. Uh, well, actually, I, we do need to just very briefly touch on that auditor update. But first, I want to finish with the body camera audit piece yeah. specifically. Um, I think what we've seen here today is that we want to work to make this better. Um, and we want to use these body cameras right. Um, important in all of our audits is the cooperation and the, and the help of those with the data. In this case, that is the police department. And so I wanted to invite Assistant Chief Jose up just to say a few words. Because we are short on time, I'm not going to ask you 
sort of the questions that were were asked here today but i'll i'll save that for public safety because i have a feeling that's the committee that this is going to so i just wanted to offer you uh, an opportunity just to say a couple words thank you madam chair and committee um i'm assistant mike jills from the police department uh and uh chief Aradano asked me to be here today and represent the police department uh, a lot, and we do take these findings very seriously. We haven't had an opportunity to see them yet, so we, we're you know ready to dig into this and see where we go moving forward, uh, what either processes or policy changes need to be made, and obviously we'll be uh, communicating back and forth with the committee on those and with the auditors. And we do appreciate uh, the level of detail that this audit uh, has gone into, um, and. Um, you know, and I, I believe we will have to work with the auditors moving forward to come up with an audit process for ourselves internally. And um, with me today, I did, uh, I do have uh, Deputy Chief uh, Halverson, who's in charge of our Professional Standards Division or uh, Bureau, uh, and Commander Granger, who is uh, oversight over our uh, Quality Assurance Unit, which is where the audit process uh, will lie, and uh, and you know the tracking of performance uh, with the cameras and and we also have uh, a commander glampy with us who he is the IT side of this now he oversight over the technology uh, so I want you to know that we do take this very seriously and if you have any questions I'm glad to answer great um, in the interest of time I just want to thank you for being here today um, I have some follow-up suggestions unless somebody wants to go first um, because we think this report requires further action, I think that's safe to say, we have a number of next steps. First, I'd like to receive and file the report and direct staff to publish it um, and also to send it to the state as part of our mandatory reporting requirement. I think that that's a really important precedent to set here today. Uh, so could I have a, could I have a, so moved. thanks. Second. Great. Um, all those in favor of receiving and publishing this report and sending um, the Minnesota statute section to the state, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. I want to give the report to the clerk. Um, and there's copies here for people in the audience that might want to see that, um, it, along with copies of some of the slides that Mr. Tetzel just went through. Second, I'd like to refer this to the full council with a recommendation that it go to Public Safety, Civil Rights, and Emergency Management Committee. For further consideration, uh, if it, it, I, I do expect that if that committee will be asking the police department to then continue, that's the appropriate place to do it. So, if I may have a motion on that, so moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Um, opposed. The ayes have it, and the report will be received and filed, published, sent to the state, and also sent to city council. Um, finally, I'd like to direct the audit department to work with MPD on their next steps direct by the issues outlined in this audit and to report back to this committee, um, the auditor report back to this committee by the end of the year to update us on its progress. Could I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and the audit department will report back to this committee before the end of the year. Um, just very briefly, Mr. Tetzel has also report, prepared an update for the committee of, of previous audit reports and his audit plan. Um, if you want to just briefly go through these slides, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know what we've done. Um, the projects that we've initiated to date to complete our 2017 audit program are the police records management system implementation consultation, um, an IT third party audit, the off street parking audit that we've started a payroll audit, um, a third party audit of Meet Minneapolis, a third party audit of Diversion Solutions, and the automatic license plate reader audit that we'll be working with Hennepin County on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a, a quick question that's been asked up here on the dais is the slides that you just presented today, could those be made public be made available and could we get copies of them here on the dais? Yes, we will send them to the audit committee and publish them on our website. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions or follow-up? None? Um, 
Well, if with that completed, could I have a motion to receive and file this internal auditor's update, please? Move. So moved. Second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. The ayes have it, and the report from the auditor is received and filed. Um, one special note of thanks that I wanted to make to the audit department for this. Um, while Mr. Tetzel did all of the presentation on the body camera audit, I really want to appreciate the work and effort of Mr. Kirill Vasiliev um, and the rest of the audit team here, and they're all sitting here in the second row today. So thank you for the work on this. It was a lot more robust than you had originally planned for in your 2017 work plan at the beginning of the year, but I, I think it's, it's good work and it's going to help us all move forward. Um, so with that, colleagues, we've completed all items on our agenda today. So seeing no further business to be presented, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.